everyone. I'm so excited that so many of you have decided to join us today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening where, wherever you are around the globe. Uh, I am joined today by uh, Kimberly Gray. I just want her to say hello, and she will kick it off. We are going to co-moderate the session this morning. Good morning. Thank you, Charlotte. So I'm Kimberly Gray, and I am on the board of directors as one of the directors of community engagement for the women of color in pharma. So before we get started in our discussion, I'd like to share with you about our organization. Women of Color in Pharma, also known as WOSIP, is a global professional society focused on empowering women, particularly Black and Latina women, to excel in their careers in the pharmaceutical industry. It was co-founded in 2015 by Charlotte Jones Burton and Patricia Cornett, along with seven other co-founding members to address the unique and, uh, challenges faced by women of color in the workplace. Our vision is to enable the transformation of the pharmaceutical professional landscape by illuminating women of color who are poised for position of impact and building a robust pipeline. Our mission is to empower women of color in pharma to excel in their personal and professional development and transform their pathway within the pharmaceutical industry. Our ambition is to enhance the visibility of women of color in pharma, their work, their aspirations, and their needs. So why do we do this? Data has shown that business perform performance increases when there is a greater diversity in the workplace. Women of color are well represented at entry level positions but are not at the highest levels and are less likely to have access to senior leaders in their organization. We are a nurturing and safe environment for Black and Latina women for personal and professional growth and address the critical innovation and leadership gaps required to promote them within the pharmaceutical industry. Today, we have over 350 members in the United States and in Europe. Our digital and social media platforms have expanded to over 3,000 individuals and we have over 12 corporate sponsors. Since its inception, we have transformed the landscape of women of color in the workforce. We have numerous testimonies of women moving into higher level positions and taking stretch assignments with increased visibility. WOSIP has much to offer to members and to non-members. On March 28th, we gave a virtual panel um, hearing from physicians on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you missed this discussion, please visit our website at wosup.org for the recording. We also have um, a 30-day Get Fit program, and you can join us on Facebook for this and many other types of fitness, um, fitness opportunities for those of you who are missing the gym. <laughs> on April 18th, from one to five, we're going to have a virtual vision board party. Bring your magazines, your scissors, your tape, whatever you need to make your vision board. You can just bring your computer and make your vision on, uh, board on PowerPoint. It's a party, so don't forget your drinks and your snacks. We're gonna have a great time. And then on Sunday, April 19th, we will continue with our Bring Your Brand series where Kara Parker Walsh, Dr. Kara Parker Walsh, excuse me, will teach us how to discover our story and align it with our brand. Now, this event is for WOSIP members only, but you still have time to become a member. Visit our website and become a member of WOSIP and so that you can participate in these and many other great offerings to develop your personal and professional self. Now, on to self-made. Awesome. So let's get started. Thank you, Kimberly, for taking us through that and sharing um, with our audience uh, a little bit of information about our organization, as well as some of the events that we have planned. I'm super excited to transition to why we're here today. Um, what I'm hoping that we'll do is have a very informal discussion um, that has been inspired by the movie uh, Self Made. And we will talk today about how women of color are depicted in the movie, but also in society with our panelists. We'll also talk about what biases professional women uh, of color confront in their communities. Uh, that impact their confidence as they show up in the world. And we'll then end by talking about how the power of the collective helps women of color rise. 
So before we get into the, the discussion, I think it's important for us to know, and I'm looking to see what the number is who have joined us, but we have made some assumptions uh, for today's discussions. We have assumed that you all who are joining us have viewed the Netflix series Self Made. I say that because we will not uh, give a lot of context and history about the movie itself, we are going to have a discussion and just assume that our girlfriends and boyfriends who have joined us uh, for this discussion have already watched it and are ready for the talk. Um, we assume that you know that this was a movie. It was inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker, and it is not completely factual. We also will make the assumption uh, that that you know that there are, um, although there are a number of historical figures uh, that were mentioned in the movie, that the character of Addie Monroe is inspired by the person Annie Malone. And we're so excited because today you're going to meet one of her descendants. I also will add that today's discussion reflects the opinions of our guests and does not represent the views of our organization. So why don't we get started and have our uh, panelists who have joined us for today's discussion introduce themselves. Why don't we start with Cecilia? Thank you, Charlotte. And good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to join with this gathering today. So um, I am what I call a self-empowerment artist. And some of you might know that as an executive coach, but I believe in self-empowerment in order to achieve the things that you want to do. And I founded the Strategy Chick based on the fact that you need strategies in order to succeed and be successful in, your, in both your personal and professional life. So a little bit about me. I am a very proud, sexy genarian. And that basically <laughs> I am in my 60s and proud of it. Over the span of 40 years, I've had a very successful and um, just exciting career with lots of changes. And through that time, I've, I've had six careers. I've worked for nine different companies, holding 15 different positions with five relocations, three years worth of sabbaticals to have children. I have a husband who I love dearly. I also have a husband because sometimes you have casualties along the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a wife, I'm a mother to five, a sister to two, and a friend to many. And my, my motto for my life at this time is the rest will be the best. And so I believe in the power of positivity. I uh, became affiliated with WOSA through Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, I, I work with her, I coach her. I've been coaching and working with Charlotte for a couple of years. And last year I had an opportunity to host a workshop on using improv to improve your communication. So I've worked with WOSIP and, and the women uh, in pharma and have several clients across the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, again, I'm very happy to join you today and to talk about this movie and the impact that it had with, on me. And I'm going to turn it over back to Charlotte. Great, thank you. Um, Cecilia for joining us and um, we look forward to hearing from you more today. Uh, Monique, I'm going to now ask you to introduce yourself. Hello everyone. Um, hello to the Wilson community in particular. I am your new, one of your new directors of community engagement. I've been with Wilson for a while. Last year I was the new Jap one of the New Jersey chapter leads and prior to that I was one of the conference co-chairs. So I'm very ingrained in the Wilson culture, but in my professional life I work for VMS. I've been in the pharma industry for about 12 years. The first seven years I spent in discovery chemistry and I will sometimes refer to myself as a recovering chemist because sometimes the way I interact does have those roots into how I think about things and how I approach problems. I spent the next two years in clinical operations and a year after that into project management. And just this past month, I started a new job in clinical trial recruitment, kind of bringing it, bringing everything a little full circle. I am excited to be here with you guys. I'm excited to just discuss this movie. Um, it invoked a lot of feelings in me. I um, watched it with one of my cousins because she was like, we have to see this. and. I'm just ready to dive into this conversation. So I will give it back to Charlotte now. 
Great, thank you. I am too ready to dive in. But before we go there, we have one more panelist. Pam, can you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Pamela Thorpe, or as the slide says, Pamela Turnbow Thorpe. Um, I am a board certified internist. I've had an interesting career of practicing academic medicine at Cooper Hospital for about 13 years, where I um, had a large primary care practice in Camden, New Jersey. Um, and I also mentored residents and medical students and fellows along the way. I have an interesting personal um, story that led to my transition into pharma where I was diagnosed with lupus. I actually diagnosed myself with lupus and it took about five years before I had agreement amongst my specialist and God was very for, uh, was very gracious to me that I was able to reinvent myself. So I recognized that I could not perform the duties that I normally did in the internal medicine world. And um, God opened up some doors to allow me to enter into the pharma realm. So since uh, 2007, I have actually been in the industry um, the same amount of time that I was in clinical practice. I have functioned as a, a safety physician or I am in the field of pharmacovigilance. That is where I had the opportunity to meet Charlotte at BMS. Um, we were actually on a, a project um, and there were quite a few number of uh, women who were of color on that project and we had a great time working together. Um, and since then, I am now at Janssen. Uh, I am uh, a mother of one and I have a bonus child um, and I am married. And it's really a great opportunity to meet with the group today. I'm looking forward to talk a little bit about my own personal family history, but also hear what other people have mm. to share. Thank you. Thanks to all of our panelists. You guys have been wonderful. Um, as you have shared, um, each of you, what your thoughts are about the, uh, the series. Um, it was picked up, whether you talked about it on social media or a personal phone call. And uh, Kimberly and I are just um, looking forward to what we get into today. So uh, as Monique mentioned, the movie invoked, uh, evoked a lot of emotion. I'm sure uh, if you have seen the movie as I have now twice, I watched it again last night to make sure that I um, caught everything that we were going to discuss today. Um, but there is some controversy in the movie. Um, and what's so interesting is um, that the controversy is around um, some of the um, fiction in the movie. And uh, Carmine uh, Ijogo, who played Addie in the movie um, posted on her social media site that it is fictional. And she reminded us um, to, uh, to use this opportunity to do exactly what we're doing today, which is to dive deeper into mm -hmm. our conversation and to then learn more about um, those that were, were in the movie. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, kick us off with our first question, which I'm gonna give to Cecilia. Um, I know that this series inspired you to dive deeper. Um, indeed. Can you tell us a little bit about your overall thoughts about the series and maybe one thing that moved you to look deeper? Yes. So first, let me just preface my, my comments with, I'm glad that the movie was made mm -hmm. and that we are all engaged in this conversation. So little has been uh, talked about outside of the Black community about Madam C.J. Walker. So bringing it to light, bringing her story to light is very important. So when I started to watch the movie, I was just all geared up to just hear about her entire background. I was thinking about it more from facts and learning. And I quickly realized as the movie started that it was fictionalized, that there was a lot of drama brought into it to draw an audience. and it made me pull out my phone and I'm Googling things as soon as a scene would come up in the movie, I'm questioning the, the, how real is this? So right away, I had to separate how I watched the rest of the film and realize that it was done for entertainment value. Mm -hmm. As I got towards the end of it though, I did recognize that there were some key themes that resonated with me. 
And the first one was, you know, when it said self-made, I had to think about how difficult it had to be for her to launch this business through Jim Crow times. And what kind of um, reservoir of strength did she pull from in order to do that? How did she harness the collective power, as we refer to it today, of other women? How did she get the exposure, not just the drive, but what did she get in order to put, lay out the financial um, platform and template that grew her business? And that led to the thing that stuck out for me the most, which is leadership. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about it uh, a little bit uh, later in, in our discussion today, but her leadership towards the end of that movie, when she stands up and recognizes that she needs to make some shifts in order to keep her business growing and thriving and, and to keep the connection with the people who work for her was amazing. So those were the things that stood out for me the most that I liked. And the parts that troubled me were just how we were depicted as, as Black women. Um, the focus mm -hmm. on the poor relationships, the focus on colorism, um, you know, is it, and then the relationship between Addie and, and Madam C.J. Walker was so contentious. And it makes it difficult when these images are constantly perpetuated in the media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a lot that we could go in on right there. Um, but in the interest of wanting to get through all of the panelists, and I'm sure um, for those that are listening, and I'm sure some of you are nodding your heads, I'm going to remind you if you have a question, put it in the chat room, because um, we're going to move on to our, our next panelist and question. Monique, I'm going to give this one to you because I noticed on your social media that you were encouraging people to watch the series, and, and I was wondering, what was it that excited you um, about this movie? And then what was the one thing that disturbed you? Well, um, growing up, I've always known of Madam C.G. Walker's story and it's something to be inspired because we know that a time period where she did this, she became a millionaire during this Jim Crow area and people struggle to get there now. And just to do it during that time period, that speaks a lot to her fortitude and her ability to, to navigate. And we think about navigating the corporate landscape, we think about navigating the times now, but to navigate during that time period, that really just, that speaks to um, her character and the ability and her team that she must have formed to help do that. So I was very interested in, in seeing that story. And um, speaking with one of my cousins, we decided we wanted to watch this together because it was, you know, empowerment. And so we were very excited to watch it. Uh, one of the things that disturbed me the most was that relationship between Addie Malone and her. Um, I didn't, so I'm like, okay, let me find this out. So I think I spent a lot of time, like Cecilia, I was Googling it. I had to stop the movie just so I could watch <laughs> a whole entire research moment to learn the truth about that. Because I'm like, I thought I knew a lot of the story, but I never knew of, you know, this um, battle that we have. And I usually think of the battle maybe being in the time period that had she had it. I know she must have faced a lot of struggles just by doing this in that time period. So I expected the challenge to be overcoming that and not some, some character. So it was great to do the research and learn about, um, Miss Malone and actually see how great she was in that time period, even though she may have not become the name that we learned and the household name as quickly for most of us. But I think it's like Google, right? We know we have several search engines, but people will say Google it, but that may not be the source they're going to. So Madam C.J. Walker became a little larger than life, but this made me realize how many other people, you know, were doing great things um, and get another light of another woman of color who was making strides during the same time period and doing really great things. So I'm thankful because it irritated me enough to, to put the movie down and press pause for a moment and go through a Google search, which I wouldn't have done and I wouldn't have known of her great story without um, having that moment. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting, both of you have talked about and kind of hit on what troubled you about the, the movie, which was the relationship um, that uh, was depicted between um, the two women, Sarah Bree Love and um, Addie Monroe as in the movie. I jumped into the, the series not really thinking about um, what I was about to watch, but um, almost immediately um, I said, wait a minute, something's not right here. It was just this, this emotion um, that was inside of me that 
I intuitively said, this is, this is not real. And then I went back to the title and I said, oh, it says inspired by. So that led me to then know that it was um, fictional. And Monique, it's so interesting that you talk about um, your, you, you, di you dove deeper to understand, try to understand who was this other woman um, that was in the movie and was dubbed Addie Monroe. I guess for our next panelist, uh, Pam Turnbow Thorpe, you didn't need to dive deeper because you knew the real. So what I'm going to ask you is if you could just give us um, give us a little bit of uh, of a history lesson um, about your great aunt. Uh, Madam Annie Malone, and I have here what you posted um, around the same time that Monique posted on her social media, you posted this very long history lesson um, on your social media channel and basically said that it, uh, your, your great aunt, um, the way she was depicted was very distorted, inaccurate, was really disturbing to you. And then you went ahead to set the record straight. So I'm going to give you the platform now to just um, give us a history lesson. Tell us about your family. Tell us about your aunt. What is it that you want us to know? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. I, I have to admit that I am not the expert historian in the family, but I can share with you what I know. Um, and I can tell you that uh, Annie, I'll call her Annie because it's a little bit easier than saying Madam a Annie Turnbull Malone. Um, Annie was my grandfather's sister. So all of the information that I have is really based on family verbal history. Um, and so when we were growing up, my father would share, my, and my uncle would share stories about how Annie, um, had such an influence in the community that at one point they actually lived in a mansion in Philadelphia in the early 1900s. Um, subsequently, the relationship between my grandfather and his sister fell apart and th they ended up living in poverty in the depression. And so part of that led to the reason for why we don't hear about the story. The same thing also happened to Annie where she had accumulated this wealth, but subsequently lost all of it. And so she's not in a lot of the history books. There have been large movements for people to rewrite history and to get her story out. So I can say in terms of the, the series, there were two positive things. One, it gave an opportunity to share Madam C.J. Walker's story, but it also propelled our great aunt story into the forefront. So it ended up being an indirect positive effect for our family because there have been a lot of discussions about, well, who was this other person? Right. So when, when um, the, what, what I can share with you is that um, my grandfather uh, was born to um, uh, parents who were slaves. And at that time in the 1800s, he, my great great grandfather, fought with the Union and was able to get his freedom after emancipation and moved up to Illinois. And my great grandfather purchased farmland, and was, uh, it was there where Annie Malone actually learned a lot about farming and plants herb medicines and treatments um, from one of her aunts that she was able to take forward into the beauty industry. Interestingly, she also learned about the entrepreneurship from my grandfather. My grandfather was a, a brick maker and he had one of the largest business in the area in Illinois. Um, and so, she, and he actually had attended Tuskegee and met um, Booker T. Washington and had a relationship with Booker T. Washington. So all of the principles that my grandfather learned there, he brought back to Annie Malone and she was learning how to empower people and how to make Black um, women in particular more responsible for their own health care, their presentations, and their, their ability to contribute to society. So as a result, um, to shorten the story, she and her sister um, were able to take the products that she was making and, and turn it into a company. Um, this company ended up uh, employing a lot of uh, women across the nation and also internationally. Um, the thousands of women were her distributors. And of
of one of those distributors was Madam C.J. Walker. So it started that Madam uh, C.J. Walker went to the school, learned um, what she could from the program and took it back to her area and started her own um, industry. Um, and then after that, there in the history books, there, there is some discussions about um, how um, my aunt, my great aunt was one of the largest uh, contributors to historically black colleges and universities. Um, she uh, frequently um, uh, gave promotions to her employ employees, and she was really uh, about building up uh, self-sufficiency within the community. Um, she did create an orphanage that's still around today in, in St. Louis, and um, uh, her legacy it continues in that area in St. Louis. So as a family, we're very grateful that this story gave us an opportunity to share her um, legacy. Um, she uh, was reported the first Black female millionaire, but because her story was lost, um, and it was not at a time where um, even my parent, my father, and his brother were able to push that story forward. There was no internet, there were no production companies, there was no way to get that type of information out at the time, and they were too busy trying to survive. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very, we're very grateful mm -hmm. that this topic has come up. I do have a younger cousin who has made it her life mission um, to push the story forward. So if people are interested, she actually did an interview recently with Black Enterprise. And so now we have the energy um, within the family with the younger portion of the family who can take the, the story forward. So thank you for an opportunity to share that. Great. That's wonderful to listen to you. And I, as you as you were talking, I'm I'm reminded and in awe of the fact that passing on our history, even orally, is is important. It's very important. So thank you for sharing that. And you know, one of the things that your great aunt um, was that I don't see listed on your page, but I know it's because you had so much that you wanted to get out. She was a scientist, just like you. Uh, you know, she was a scientist, and many of the women that are on um, this call as well are scientists. So I want to give a shout out. Out, um, mm -hmm. to her for not only being um, the amazing uh, entrepreneur, um, inventor, philanthropist, but she was also a scientist. So that, that's amazing uh, to indeed hear her story. So there are so many themes that come up in the movie Self Made. And I, I want to reiterate the fact that I like that the movie was made also because it gives us a chance to talk about them and learn more of our history. And there are some positive themes, but then there's the themes that continuously come up for us as women of color. Um, there's the themes of colorism, the hair thing, sexuality, unhealthy relationships, health, taking care of ourselves or not taking care of ourselves. And you know, what legacy are we leaving? And then there's the infamous one of women of color feeling like we must fit in to be successful. And I'm willing to bet that all of us have faced some bias in relationship to, some, to one or even more of these themes. Monique, can you share one of the bias that you may have faced in your professional career or even in your personal life? All right, all right. So related to business, um, I think I remember when I started off my career. Is there an echo? Um, when I started off my career, I, I was a chemist, right? So there was a lot of biases there because not many Americans do chemistry. Not many women do chemistry. Mm -hmm. and chemistry and so I've had a couple of people who were like a little surprised especially when I started grad school there's like oh it's hard to find Americans who do this <laughs> and then there's other moments where it's hard to find women or we're hard to find black I'm like well you found me and I know there are others so that's a bias but I think we can think about those those biases and the microaggressions but I think the biggest bias is kind of when we get into that pay differential I remember mm. you know, our company did an audit of their our pay Mm -hmm. um, I got a pay bump and a few other, I talked to a lot of the other ladies, they got a pay increase. But when I spoke to some of the guys, they didn't have that type of, type of pay mm -hmm. because they were already at the level. So I think that type of bias affects us throughout our whole career because my mm -hmm. promotions that were on were based on what my first um, salary was. It was like, oh, you got a 20% increase or a 10% increase. But if I started off at the wrong place, that type of biases that went into what they paid me and how women 
I always make will make a lot less in terms of women's equal pay day is in April, but black women is in August and we get to Latino women, we're talking about November. I think that bias is a combination of a lot of smaller biases, but that bias I think affects us the most and it, it bothers me the most. Wow. I didn't know that um, I, I had the same experience as you, Monique. Um, I am a chemist by training, and I also, later on in my career, had that exact same thing. Wow, I got a great pay raise. And I was just thinking during that time how great it was. And then I realized, so all this time, <laughs> you've been paying <laughs> less than what I'm worth? I, I totally have the same experience. Um, Pam, can you share a bias that you may have encountered in your professional or personal life? Did we lose Pam? Is she on mute? I am on mute. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get rid of extra feedback that we heard. Um, I, when I think about biases, I think about um, how when we enter a room as a Black woman, mm -hmm. what type of message is going through the heads of the people who are in the room. I can think of very distinct times in when I was an attending in the hospital where I would enter into the patient's room and I may, I, at one point I had 10 mm. people on the team and uh, they were residents and medical students and the majority of them were white. At the time, I probably looked like I was about 18. Wow. Um, and you know, the patients would automatically assume that the tallest white man in the room was the attending. And then when I had to turn around and say that I was the one in charge, it sort of took them aback. Um, the same thing happens in pharma, you know, when you go into the room and then um, there may be a, a, a discussion that requires some input. And then when you give the input, people say, oh, okay, uh, you do know what you're doing. Or um, mm. so I think that really interferes with our um, ability to contribute because people have preconceived notions about who we are and what we bring to the table. A lot of times I'll have to say, um, you know, I've had experience doing this type of activity several times and they say, oh, you have, then you have to validate yourself. Yeah. So you're in a position where they have the preconceived notions about who you are and what you can bring to the table, but then you in turn have to validate your, your value um, that you bring to the scenario. Yes, thank you for that. Have to validate ourselves. And sometimes this can be, um, you know, a hurdle for us because we focus on validating ourselves instead of focusing on actually doing what we do best, mm -hmm. you know, really using our talents. And so that sometimes can become a distraction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a uh, professional coach, Cecilia, how could you, how would you help us teach women, teach women how to navigate through these encounters? Great question. So the first place to start, is I'm, I'm getting a little feedback I'm not sure it's really the theme that I, I introduced which is about self-empowerment so we know when you walk into those rooms whether it's the boardroom or you're going to operate you know that bias is there where you really have to uh, begin is to think about the triggers and what it does to you and your psyche that might prevent you from filling your seat to the fullest extent when you come in the room. So when I give strategies uh, in, in terms of self-coaching, you have to look inside first and say, okay, what does this trigger for me? And how am I reacting to it? Because that's the energy that you're bringing into the room. And it also impacts your self-confidence. So I like to give um, what I call the three F's, it's the F word, and it's all about facing. It's the face off. The first thing you do is to face yourself. And this is all a part of dealing with the bias. What does that bias do to you internally? And how can you become more self-aware of what you're doing when you enter the room? So face yourself. The second thing to do is to face the shift or change in the room when you come when you bring your, your whole self in, what are some of the dynamics that are occurring? And make those observations, take mental notes. And then I call the third face others. That's when you take your communication style 
you take your awareness of the situation and you make the shifts necessary to meet the people where they are. So if you know you walk into that room and someone is addressing you incorrectly or um, they're not aligned with where you're trying to lead, you have to stop in that moment and deal with it. That's where we often have challenges and that's where we need to have more uh, the strength to do self-empowerment. So I, I start with looking at self first, looking at the situation, and then how do you communicate with others in order to deal with the bias? Thank you for that. That was great. And I can see I need more coaching in that area. And just a little plug, as a member of WOSIF, you can get that coaching. Kim, you know something that... I think is really interesting. And maybe the feedback is coming from my microphone that um, Cecilia said um, in terms of facing yourself. And I want to yes. bring it back to the movie because I do think that um, in, in the movie, um, Sarah had to do this mm. many times. Um, it was really internally her confidence. She had low, uh, low confidence and we could, we saw it in the movie come up several times in the beginning you know she talked about hair and the power that hair has uh, she um, when her hair started to grow back um, that became a, something that she said and a part of her story um, which was my uh, she said my hair grew back and so did my confidence mm -hmm. she even said and i got me a new man when that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was her confidence. Also, um, the, the fighting series, whenever they would go into the fighting, that was in her mind. And she was having uh, to really, even though they depicted it as her fighting with Addie, it was an internal struggle mm -hmm. that she had. Did, did any of you pick up on that? Or was that just me? No, uh, definitely, Charlotte. I I saw that and speaking to the lack of confidence, she would send CJ to try to um, get the meetings set up with Booker T. Washington. She would not represent herself initially. So all of those themes ran through it. And a lot of it was based on the shame that she felt about her hair and her color being dark, being, um, you know, classic black features, so to speak. So, I, that did definitely run through the, the movie for me. Anyone else want to speak on that before we move on? Kim, any last words? And we're going to get to the comments in the, uh, the chat when we get to the Q&A. But why don't we, um, you know, why don't we move forward? You know, another um, theme of the series um, that, that definitely came through was needing to um, come together as women um, and, and the power that we can bring from that. And, and when I went back and, and watched the series a second time, you know, for me, this scene was the, the money shot of the whole movie. Um, and, and this was the scene, if I could just give a little bit of context, you know, um, uh, Madam C.J. Walker thought that getting in front of, she was trying to find investors for her factory, and she thought um, that getting in front of men, uh, Booker T. Washington in particular, was going to be the way to go. And as Cecilia mentioned, she, you know, asked her husband, uh, C.J., to, to help get tickets for the convention. She was going to get up on stage. Um, he assured her that she should um, go to the convention, but that she should go to the uh, to the room and with the other ladies, but she um, was did not want to do that. That was not where she felt that she should be. Um, she did interact with his wife, who is in this um, this picture at the lower um, right hand corner, uh, left hand corner. Um, interacted with his wife, and um, and they actually told her, um, you know, he, what he's doing is his thing, and what we do is our thing. Mm -hmm. So they they actually told her, we have our own thing. 
Yeah. Uh, she didn't really listen to it. Then they told her again, you know, I, this is our thing. And we have, you know, I think it was something like 250 um, women that were a part of it. And at that moment, I was thinking, well, there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. Just bond with your sisters. Um, mm -hmm. And she ignored that. You know, she continued to turn a blind eye to these women because of what she assumed it meant to be associated with them. Now, if I'm on your street now, don't don't get upset with me. Um, but she didn't see it. And then they came to her, though. They then came mm. to her. They she opened the door. She saw these women there. There was a box inside of the box were checks and they were making donations and ended up being the first investors in her uh, in her factory. And I thought about that. And I thought about even what we do with women of color and how powerful that is. So Monique, let me ask you, you know, although um, this movie and Madam CJ Walker is acclaimed as being the first self-made millionaire, as evidenced by this scene, we, we really never do anything great solely on our own. How would you say that this was true for Madam C.J. Walker? And, and just talk a little bit about what this scene meant for you. Okay. So first, um, this, I want to go to this scene. Um, this scene definitely spoke to me a lot because a lot of times we're looking for support in the wrong places and we're not able to see the places that are right in front of us because we think it comes from this one place, like in her case, she was thinking it was coming from Booker T. Washington or from the men and not seeing that. So I think we are all sometimes guilty of that, or at least I know I have been. And then you start seeing what is there for you and the opportunities that you can take. But in terms of self-made, I think the word self-made sometimes has a, a weird connotation because we're thinking about self-made, but self-made should not be confused with solo made. Yes. So she was self-made in the sense that she didn't come from money didn't have someone else, her dad, to give her all the stuff to start herself. She, so she started it herself in that way. But it wasn't solo. You can see from these women, you can see from the fact that CJ, her husband, was an advertising man and the influence that he had on developing that brand. You can see from the lawyer who she worked with who helped do this with business strategy. There's places where we look on the history where he was going to the NAACP and talking to other people and educating because he was not just a worker, but he was integral and part of the design of this. So I think we have to understand the self-made means that you didn't inherit this, but she wasn't solo. And I think she appreciated that and understood to get the right people on her team. And I think it's very important that we all learn how to recognize people who are good teammates. Even if I think back to the conversation that Charlotte and I had earlier this week, I was talking about working with different teams and new teams and learning it. And she mentioned to me, she's like, Monique, when you find someone who gels with you and you can work that way, you need to keep that person around. And I think Madam CJ Walker did that, right? She found these people who could work with her, who could propel her. And she kept them around. And her success was, was greater because she picked the right team. And yeah. if you think about professional development, we talk about not only having a coach, not having just a mentor, but sponsors and having that whole board of directors that can help you. So she was an example of, if you want to be self-made and you want to get yourself out of something, you're going to need to get a team of people mm -hmm. who get you understand and can help propel you to the next place. And I love my team. I think um, I've had friends who were not in pharma before I interview. My friend is a leader in her company. She did a mock interview with me. And she ended up telling me where I stopped. She's like, well, you gave a great answer until you put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> and because I said, I said all this other stuff and then I brought up my limitations. She's like, I was believing in you and I was believing in you until you said that. And I needed a team mm -hmm. that could say that out loud to me. And I'm thankful mm -hmm. for that. And she's a constant member on my team for everything. And I think Madden Stewart, because she picked a team that can do that. And we all need to do that. And just thinking about Wosa, well, that's one of the reasons why I'm a part of that, because I need people like that on my team. Mm -hmm. uh, I need people to be honest. You know, uh, can I interject oh, yeah. for a second? Great comments. I love it. What this scene said to me is that she had finally accepted herself. Mm. You remember when she first met these women, she was intimidated by them. Mm. She did think that the power was with the men, but she looked down on herself. Mm -hmm. And when she grew in confidence, she could hear them. She couldn't hear them mm. and see them before because she was the filter that she was looking through was one of self-doubt. I don't belong mm. there. And, and think about how we kind of do that to ourselves in, in society with the different um, sororities and uh, organizations we have. Are you in the links? Are you in the AKAs? Are you a Delta? What, whatever. 
the collective is strong, but sometimes getting into it feels intimidating. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I saw when she was standing in front of those women the first time. Mm -hmm. When she opened the door and realized that they were there and shared in that, you could see the walls come down. Yes. So that was the first. And then the second point that I'd like to make is many times when you're really great at something, you're in execution mode. And she was in execution mode the whole time. So it's difficult to trigger the other side of your brain that's necessary in order to say, how do I grow? How do I bring others along and align? Because she's got her head down and she's trying to make something happen. This is what we have a tendency to do in our roles in corporate. We think we're going to be recognized if we just get it done. Your head's down, you're going to execute. Mm -hmm. And so it is important to lift up and look for that collective and, and join forces with others who can help you maintain your level of self-awareness as well as your um, self-empowerment and impact. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Cecilia, I think that's so important. I'm going to challenge you a little bit because she was in execution mode when she pulled Ransom off the street too, right? <laughs> like she was, she was still able to pull him off the street and see that she needed him because he had something um, that was of worth to her. Why was it not that when she saw these women, why was she intimidated initially? And it took time for her and they, they actually, to their credit, had to come back to her you know, multiple times. And I think it's important for us to realize that there are so many emotions that come up and, and we stir up emotions for each other. And many of them have been perpetuated uh, throughout um, our society and in our communities. Um, so kudos to them for continuing to come back to her. But I do think that there was uh, some something a little bit more than her being in execution mode when she turned a blind eye to them and wanted to go back and sit with all the men. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, we are in agreement. We're in a yeah. full agreement on that, Charlotte, um, because I think her self-image was, was low. And, and she compared herself to these women of society and what would trigger every, she'd see them, their, their hair, they're all done up. They have uh, what appears to be strong relationships and families. And she looked at herself and said, okay, I'm overweight. I, my hair did grow back, but I don't look as polished and elegant as they are. She was judging herself through all of those lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times we have to be vulnerable as women too, to understand when we need help. A lot of times people don't want to, can you hear, oh, you, you're saying amen, Charlotte? I couldn't see. <laughs> I'm saying hello to Miss Kendall. You know, the younger generation is with us as well. So okay. uh, Latoya Coffee's daughter, Kendall, was at the, at the <laughs> so I was just saying hi to her. Sorry, Pam. That's okay. No, I was just saying we have to learn to be vulnerable and understand our weaknesses, that we have to understand that when we need help, we need to reach out. And a lot of times these networks that we have shift. Everything is for a season. You know, there, there are times when you have a core group of people who can really push your agenda forward. And when you reach that limit, I think sometimes we have to acknowledge that maybe we need to get some supports from a different um, group of, of people. And, and I think um, someone else mentioned that sometimes it's not even people with, uh, within the, the environment that we're working in. It may be from family members, just to get another perspective. Maybe I'm not approaching this the way that I should. How do I respond to this situation? How do I handle with um, a level of discomfort um, in the workplace? And I, I think relationships are really key for the ones who help to empower us, but also building those relationships to help get our agenda forward. And I think that's what we saw in the movie that CJ, Madam CJ Walker was just plowing forward to try to find the right niche to get the support that she needed to help her move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And, and I'm gonna come back to the, the piece about being vulnerable because I do think that that came up um, continuously um, in the movie in order for Madam C.J. Walker to get women to um, open up and even try her product. She had to be vulnerable. And the way in which she did that was she began to tell her story. Mm -hmm. And she began to tell how amazing um, the product would, had been for her and what it meant to her 
And, and then she would say to women, you know, if you use this, it will mean the same for you. And I'm reminded of the scene um, in the middle of the market where she pulls the women mm -hmm. forward and she begins to tell her story. And so it's not so much the product, but they began to believe in her mm -hmm. by her sharing her story. Mm -hmm. And I think the power of our story is um, is so amazing and it will allow others to see us um, in a way that helps them uh, help soften who we are, um, but then also helps them really believe in you as a powerful marketing tool mm -hmm. as well. Because, and I, you know, one of my favorites, Simon Sinek, he says, people don't buy what you sell, they buy why you sell it. And so the, it was the power of her story continued mm -hmm. uh, to come up uh, mm -hmm. throughout the, the movie as well. Mm -hmm. Any of you want to speak a little bit about that and the power of storytelling and being vulnerable? That's great comments again, Charlotte. Um, frequently in, in coaching, that is one of the strategies that I um, work with my clients on is building your brand and telling your story. Because when you start to ascend the corporate uh, structure and ladder and get promotion, it's getting the people above you comfortable with who you are. They're already comfortable with the majority. They, they know something about their backgrounds and, and what makes them tick. But we're breaking through the biases that we know exist. So in order to get them comfortable, storytelling is a very critical part to um, bring people along and get them to show your vulnerability, but also to show your leadership style and educate them on who you are and where you come from. So I agree. Definitely include that in your toolkit. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more. I think storytelling is important. And I think in her case, she not only told her story, but she was able to capture the story in the way she wanted to tell it, right? So she talks about her journey from picking cotton to, to being a wash woman to being her own business person. So she was able to create the narrative and what people wanted to, what she wanted people to say about herself. And I think it was so powerful to think about the fact that she is mad. <laughs> Madam C.J. Walker. This is during a time where a lot of women were called like auntie or auntie, like we have Aunt Jemima Sirk, but she is Madam. And I thought that brought a level of class and a ladder, a letter, ladder of gratitude into what she is doing. And I think being able to frame her narrative in a way that made her Madam and to talk about that type of confidence, that type of, I think it took a lot to just call herself Madam then. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I know in, I know, I think when I did some of my research, because I was stuck Googling in a rabbit hole that night, they said some of the French women started doing the Madam thing for, for makeup mm -hmm. and for the cosmetic industry. But just to be a Black woman in this time period, mm -hmm. Madam, not Mamie, not, <laughs> you know, not one of those other terms. And I think that goes to her story and giving that whole narrative and talking about that confidence. Like, we can do a lot with storytelling and that brand. And I think that helped propel her whole career, just having her story and her brand and having people think about what that mean. And when I talk to my sister and she first thinks about Madison C.J. Walker to ask what image comes to her mind, she thinks about that image when she's in that car in New York. And they're all looking, you know, like, it's an old picture. Black people were thought about being more poor. And I know Shaq's from where I'm from in South Carolina. And they're in this fancy car dressed up and looking like, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that, I think she did a lot with her narrative um, and her story. You know what else is important, Charlotte, I, I, to share? We're raising young Black queens as well. It's not just, you know, not just us. It's many of us have, have daughters. And the generation now, they're a little removed from the impact of colorism in their heads, they are, <laughs> but it still exists. And so the importance of having this conversation and us being able to take it back to our children and exposing them to what really uh, happens out here is also an important one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to move. Is there anyone that wanted to say something? Kim, did you want to say something? I think that we need to um, think about when we are telling our stories that we each have unique talents and gifts. Mm -hmm. When we talk about trying to fit in, we, when we talk, talk about trying to look like someone else or we face these colorism biases, we have to remember that we have our own unique gifts and talents. And this is going to add to uh, the collective. This is going to add to your team, your group. That's why you're there to add that piece 
to it. Without you, that piece is missing. And then I also wanted to mention that we need to be careful that we, as women of color, don't place these same bodies on ourselves, mm -hmm. right? That we don't look at our sisters because I feel like she didn't look to the women for that uh, assistance because maybe in the back of her mind, she didn't believe that women could help her. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful not to place these bias on, on each other mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's um, so important. And as we're talking about, um, you know, telling your story and building your brand, um, another piece of that is under is remembering your your why as well. And, um, Cecilia, although movies such as Self Made take literary licenses, um, the hope is that they will spark um, meaningful conversations. Mm -hmm. What do you hope this scene sparks for? Uh, the, the women of color who are on this phone uh, to talk about, and also the men who have joined us. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. By far, this is my favorite scene in the entire movie, and it, I, I got a chill watching it again. What you see happening is, first of all, this is leadership at its best. She recognized after her employees, after the ladies told her, we're not going to work for you if you make this shift to the drugstore distribution. And she had to make a hard and quick decision in the moment in order to save her business. And she had to listen and hear what they were saying. And then again, be vulnerable, accept it, understand what was happening and make the shift. Mm -hmm. In leadership, in, in many times you are faced with the need to make a decision, to make it strong and to communicate. And she displayed every one of those skills 110%. So what I hope that you see as you take away and, and look at that and look at yourselves and think about the times you walk into a difficult situation or you have a presentation to do where you have to um, align people in that room. Mm -hmm. She spoke to them. Mm -hmm. She let them know that they were part of the collective, that they were important. She acknowledged their feelings, and then she made the decision that needed to be made and delivered it with conviction. Mm -hmm. She stepped into her power. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was a poignant moment, and that's something that each of us has to do at some point, whether it's in our personal or professional lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so important. I see some head nods. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone else who wants to say something on the panel about this scene and what it meant to you. I think okay. Cecilia summed that up pretty well. Yeah, she, she did. did. She <laughs> actually hit it. The, yeah. well, she went back to her why, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really um, critical to doing the work and understanding what your why is so that when you become distracted, you can come back to that uh, and it really keeps you grounded and focused. Mm -hmm. So my last question, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to see what people have been, just been writing some great, great things in the chat and Lucretia is going to speak about that and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But my last question is to Pam. Pam, your, your great aunt left an amazing legacy. Mm -hmm. Madam CJ Walker was a part of that legacy. Mm -hmm. What legacy do you hope to leave? Wow. <laughs> I, well, first off, I, I would hope that my legacy would be that I was available and that I helped people as I mm -hmm. went along the way. You know, particularly in this era that we're living now um, with people who are dying from COVID-19, um, families who are falling apart, I hope my legacy would be similar to my great aunt, who was a philanthropist, that if I see a need, that I could meet it, not only financially, but spiritually and uh, emotionally, and that people would say that I was available. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. That, that is absolutely amazing. And that is what I know to be true about you. Mm -hmm. It's in your, in your genes, in your DNA. <laughs> Thank you. you as well. Thank you. So let's, um, I'm going to turn it over to Lucretia. If you um, captured a few of the comments in the chat um, that you want us to now come back to, that would be great for you to share. 
Thank you. Um, Pamela, I want to say there was so much conversation about the value of sharing the story about your aunt. Um, family history is very important to everyone and telling that story keeps everyone honest and 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 pretty much the, the value of her story is through storytelling from families. Mm -hmm. So everyone appreciated you telling that story and I think everyone got something out of it. Thank you. Um, there is some conversation about sponsors and how um, in the movie there was a, like now you need a sponsor or someone who can stand for you who can be at the table when you're not to create value for you. So there is conversation about that. Um, there is also a lot of conversation about black women supporting each other mm -hmm. and competitiveness between black women. Mm -hmm. uh, both was shown in the movie and how some of the things that were shown in the movie, even though it was back in the early 1900s, it's very same, it's much the same today. And some of the values that she had, we can learn from. Um, I think that um, there was some good conversation about um, the advertising flyer and how uh, she pushed back to her husband about the hair and colorism in the flyer and how important that was. And one thing that didn't come up was um, some comments about the men in the movie and the emasculation of men. And that's something we didn't talk about. We do have some men in the group. Uh, so that didn't come up at all, and I'm not sure if we want to um, address that because uh, there are several different comments in there about the men in the movie and their relationship with the women. Yeah, I think, you know, that is one of the things that um, I know and just want to thank my husband who sat through the, the movie a second time with me last night as we went through it. And that was one of the things that he and I paused and actually had a conversation about, um, which was how um, she um, emasculated her, her um, CJ, her husband, um, and the the consequences of that. Um, and I know Delvin's on the phone. I don't want to put him on the spot, but um, Delvin, just want to give you an opportunity to jump in here if there's anything that you want to say um, that came up from our discussion last night when we were talking about that. Let me unmute him. Okay. Go ahead, Delvin. No, we can't hear you yet. Let me see. So I think the, but what, well, it's not necessarily uh, a thought, but more of a question. Uh, I often wonder about the balance between um, a woman being successful on her own and a woman also recognizing the power of the support that's around her, not only from other women, but also from the men that are in her circle. Um, and there were times when I wondered whether or not Madam C.J. Walker was turning a blind eye to the men that were in her circle. Definitely Ransom was a support for her, but I think she saw Ransom in a different light in terms of what he was able to offer. And I think with her own husband, it was um, this whole notion of my versus what could be ours. Um, and, and she seemed to be really fixated on it's my company. It's my company. It's, you know, my was a big word for her when it was in reference to him, uh, as opposed to what they were able to build, uh, themselves or as a collective, right? He was in the kitchen. He was trying to do ads. He was trying to contribute. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think he necessarily found a space, uh, you know, in the company per se, or at least with her. Uh, in that particular moment. So, you know, I, I think the balance is, and the question I would put out to the women in the group is, yeah, how do you make sure you uh, continue to press forward and be empowered as a female collective, but how you also do that in conjunction with the men that are there to support you and how do you balance that? Mm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Delvin. And um, maybe I'll ask Pam, did you have something you wanted to say about that? I'm just doing a lot of head nodding. I oh. think um, I think it's difficult. Um, my husband laughs at me because the family has told him at the age of three, I used to say, I can do it myself. Wow. And, you know, when you look at successful women, a lot of times we have to drive things on our own because we're faced with a lot of that, uh, adversaries and opposition. But there there is a delicate balance with um, learning how to understand your role in a relationship with a man, be it your husband or at work. 
um, and also learning how to uh, demonstrate your own power and value and, and, and wealth in the situation. So it, it's difficult. It really depends on the other person as well. I think um, Ransom maybe had a different personality that was more uh, received by Madam C.J. Walker, but um, there was a little bit of the antagonism between she and her husband. So I, th I think it's really an individual um, situation in terms of how you can make that work, but we have to acknowledge it that when we're strong, that sometimes we have to roll it back in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And Cecilia, I see a lot of head nodding from you and, and Marvin is on the line um, in support of you as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you and, and invite you to give him the platform if you feel that's appropriate. Um, I hope he's listening because um, having been married before, and I would say uh, in, in my vulnerability, not necessarily managing that the um, relationship from this perspective as best as I could. So I, my, I'm speaking from experience. I think it is important to reach out and to communicate and to listen more sometimes than talk. Um, and then as I reflect to where I am today, I am extremely well supported. Um, and I, I'm able to be myself but I remember being raised by my dad and he would say to me, I want you to be able to do what you want to do without a man. Mm -hmm. That was the message. You will be educated. You will be able to stand on your own and be independent. And this was almost like a, a you know, topic at dinner as I was growing up. So I had that strong ferociousness of I can do this myself. And it did carry over into my relationship, and I had to learn how to tone that down. Mm -hmm. when, uh, and that, when I met Mar Marvin, was secure. Marvin was secure about who he is and what he stands for and what his own legacy was about. So he, isn't, he knows how to support me. So Marvin, if you're on and, and you want to, to join in, please do and, and give the male perspective. But he's strong, and it allows me to be even stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's amazing that you said that, um, which is uh, the, the security and the confidence of the mate um, is is one of the key factors in it, and then being able to tap into that um, to uh, increase your strength and your power, I think is also um, important as well. I see that we have someone uh, has raised their hand. Uh, Lucretia, do you want to uh, manage this portion? Yes, ma'am. Claudia, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Claudia Anderson? If you're talking, we can't hear you, but you're not on mute. Okay. Well, let's move on to there's some question about um, how how you felt about the daughter um, somewhat being thought of as gay in the movie. Um, it was never said, but there was some implication. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll just kick it off by saying that um, one of the themes on the, the list of themes that we presented was sexuality. And, and that theme showed up um, in multiple um, areas throughout the movie. Um, we saw there was a rape in the movie mm. or a potential rape. Mm -hmm. um, we saw there was adultery in the movie. And then also to the point of um, the what you just raised, we saw that there was um, homosexuality or there was a hint of it um, in terms of um, Sarah's daughter and um, the photographer. Um, uh, she was a photographer, but she was more than, than a photographer. Um, so that did show up and, and, um, and Sarah acknowledged, she saw it. And I think that there was a moment when she came down the stairs and she saw her daughter with the other woman and, um, and she 
so it was there it was in her face and I think that she wanted her daughter to marry a man if I remember her saying marry a doctor and then she married the 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 musician she wasn't happy with that um and towards the end I think she gave her permission permission to love um whomever she wanted uh to love she was most concerned about leaving a legacy mm -hmm. and i you know i thought what was amazing about the movie was that um her daughter was able to honor that mm -hmm. in a different way than her mother had in her mind but she was able to honor indeed what it was that her mother most wanted so that was well, what i saw yeah mm -hmm. charlotte i actually in terms of the um, lesbian relationship, I saw it less from a sexual perspective or a sexuality perspective and more of um, the daughter trying to be something she wasn't, that her mother was trying to mold her into um, uh, who she was and that it was, you almost saw a point at the, in the series where she decided, she came back and said, you can live your life and pretty much allow her to be who she was. So I just, another angle of that was that there was this great acceptance that her mother had to see her for who she was mm -hmm. and not make her into somebody that she wanted her to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about the power of the collective in the movie and how the power of collective today is just as important and how can we work together like they did uh, to create our own legacies and lift each other up? Mm -hmm. Well, this is something I just want to give a lot of recognition to Charlotte for because it's the thing that stood out for me immediately when I met her. She lives her mission and values. So if we all could take a moment and create our personal mission and share it you'll find areas of commonality ways to bond with each other that provide support um, always enter into the conversation and relationship with positive intent i know that for me my mission is that anyone that i come in contact with leave feeling better about themselves after having spent time with me that's my personal goal. And it comes to me because when I grew up, one of the things that um, when, when people would leave our home, they never, my, my mother never said bye. She would always say, you fill me so full. And I lost my mom about a year, a little over a year ago. And that saying of you fill me so full, when you, you, feel, you would fill your, if you visited her, you would get your stomach fed, your spirit fed, everything would be fed and you would just feel great. And so when people leave me, I want them to feel full. So if I take that mission and I share it, and that's my story, that's a way of bringing the collective together. We don't always have to think about it in terms of corporate and what, what our roles and responsibilities are. Leave from the heart. I love that you leave me full. I, I might, I might borrow that. I, that just, that spoke so much to me. <laughs> just. I love that. And I think there are small things we can do. Um, I have friends that have businesses and I love to support them and I can spend my collective dollars to making them bigger and greater and letting people know who they are. I think there's a lot of practical things we can do. And just even being a part of things like Wolf's Up where we're having collective moments where we're talking and we're helping each other and being a part of those groups. I think those are practical things we can do. But I love that daily life. I leave you so full. Uh, I'm a, yeah, I'm Cecilia. Thank you for that coaching moment. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> you left me so full right now with that. I'm sorry. That's great. Uh, okay, there was a question about her husband. She and her husband having um, a, a difference in what they believe the growth of the, how the company could grow. She thought to do it one way and he thought to do it another. And the question was, would she have been as successful if she had listened to her husband rather than following her own thoughts? So I questioned that in the movie. So and I'm going to be a little contrary. I heard them having that part and he had this different brand, but I love how great her brand is. And I know he was an advertising person. So I don't know. I wondered if some of that tension with him in terms of the way he promoted it, was that him or not? I, but that's a, that's a sidebar. But I think the separation between her brand and other people who might have done things similar 
was that strategy around her brand and having him as her mate i think he was a good strategic partner now now let's go to how the movie did it i think there is a place where if you have someone who has a different vision i've struggled with at times since i can see something and maybe i haven't had the language to explain what i'm already seeing and that i'm telling people that and they can't they're giving advice by what they know or what they've seen before but maybe what i'm envisioning has never been done before and so they can't give me language or they can't support it because they have never seen it and they're only giving me tactics that they've seen before so if you're doing it from the movie which they were talking about maybe the gibson girl look or this other um what was popular then so that's someone telling you how to do what they've seen before without being able to see what you can see so i think as visionaries and people who do see things differently sometimes you have to understand that everyone may not be able to see what you see and be able to work in that place where they may believe it better um as my cousin told me when i first started school he's like oh yeah they'll follow you after they see it mm -hmm. and that they may not be able to go along with you on that journey for all parts of it um and you can sometimes I've learned to be a little bit better with um, gracefully saying no <laughs> to that other idea that doesn't fit into what I know the vision is and allowing them to feel heard and valued, but still understanding that what they what they saw didn't fit into where I know this is going. Yeah. yeah. Can I say that there may have been places where she could have allowed her husband to, uh, you know, follow his portion of the vision or have uh, some say in it. Um, and in that respect, she may have been more successful in her relationship. Going back to mm -hmm. her why, although she wanted to help um, the uh, African-American women, although she wanted to help women, she may have helped her legacy, had a better relationship, helped her marriage. If she had found maybe some nuances or some ways that she could encourage his growth also, and not, you know, just shut him down at every angle. The way the movie per portrayed it, we don't know that that's really what she did, but the way the movie portrayed it, she gave him little opportunity to shine in any way, shape, or form. No, her, her, her husband before him, did, wasn't she in an abusive relationship? She was. So think about the mindset right. of abused women. And now she's entered into her third marriage and there could be, and I, I, I'm just guessing at this, some defensiveness, some regarded, I have to hold on to myself that comes from people or, or women who have been in abusive situations. I agree. Uh, yeah. And I think this is a powerful, this is a great conversation. And, um, you know, speaking of, her husband and his marketing techniques and, and what he saw, he wanted to go, you know, back to that angelic woman that had this long hair because that is what he thought would sell. And that's what he had seen as well as a marketer um, that, you know, that was the expertise that he brought. Um, I think that, and, and I know one of the comments was the, having that tension between them around that helped her clarify what she wanted and clarify, clarify her why. Um, and she was, you know, very confident and crystal clear that sh what she was about was to help colored women, that it wasn't about this, you know, these women that had the light skin. And, and I'm reminded of um, something that Addie said, which, co you know, colored women will do anything to look like me, even if deep down they know they can't. And so that's kind of that, you know, that sparring in terms of the colorism as well. But I think that um, Sarah, it kept her going back to know what this is why I'm here and this is what I'm here to do. And so everything, talking about your brand, everything has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be consistent. I know we only have a few moments and I'm going to, I'm going to go there. I'm going to bring up the hair um, <laughs> because we haven't talked about the hair. Um, and I, you know, the movie starts off talking about hair. Hair is beauty. It's emotion. It's our heritage. Hair tells us who we are and where we have been and where we're going. 
And then she even says, hair is power. You can't imagine what it's like until you lose it. And I just want to ask um, any of our panelists, um, as it relates to hair, is there anything um, that, that came up for you um, about hair in this movie? Definitely. I, I think what um, I have seen with the natural hair movement, it's interesting, all of us are going natural right now, not being able to get to the hair salon. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning how to hone in on some of my historical roots here, <laughs> literally. Um, I, I think that for these women, post-slavery, it was less about looking white and more about being able to get into the job force and because they were slaves. Mm -hmm. Be, you know, the gener gen very close generation prior to that was slavery and they expected the, the slaves to have a certain appearance. They didn't let them take care of themselves. And so for at least from Annie Turnbull Malone's perspective, she really wanted to empower the women so that they could improve their appearance and, um, and succeed um, financially in, in the world because she knew what it would take to be accepted by that community. On the flip side, people have taken it to the opposite extreme that, you know, if, if you um, press your hair, you're trying to look white. And so it, it, it's all about interpretation. I think for these, at least historically, for these two women, it was more about success and less about image. Nowadays, people, I think we focus a lot on how um, we um, look and, and, and uh, the media actually plays into that, that, you know, even still, um, I think it's just been a resurgence of in recent years where, you know, being Black American, being African American is looked upon favorably. So I think, you know, we have to look at the time for when these women were coming up, but then also look at how it's impacting our views now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Cecilia? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the st stories that sticks in my head that actually happened to me was in, I was working for American Express, this is in the 80s, and I didn't have a perm. I was still, I was straightening my hair. And I went on a business trip with my white colleagues, and as soon as we stepped off the plane, the humidity hit my hair, and it started to shrink up. And it was, I could feel it, I could see it shrinking up, and so could my colleague. And she just stood there in amazement and they asked me, what is happening to your hair? And I remember feeling embarrassed, like, oh my God, how am I gonna get this stuff straightened? What am I gonna do? We gotta go into this meeting and, and it's napping up on me. But she wanted to touch it, you know, they, and that still happens. You know, you're, they're mesmerized by what is going on with your hair. Again, it's what feeling does it evoke for you? And, and it was really hard for me. But if I thought that was hard, what was really harder was when I started to lose it. So, you know, they, it started to go away, then I didn't have any hair. And I had to constantly change and shift to think about myself and being comfortable with where I am, not based on what the media said I should look like, but how am I feeling inside? So it always goes back in my mind to self-empowerment, however you wear your hair. But I just wanna say with to everybody on this call, having worked in corporate for the past 40 years, I am so proud of where you are today because you walk out, your hair is in different, you, you're wearing braids, you're wearing, nat wearing it natural, you're doing what you want to do. And 30 years, 35, 40 years ago when I entered the workforce, that did not exist. Mm -hmm. We still had a uniform we had to wear. So I do want you to feel that progress is being made and I want you to continue to carry that banner. Well, thank you. And I think that's a, the note that we're gonna have to end on it was a great discussion. I'm grateful for the panelists. I'm grateful that we had um, moments to just escape from what's going on outside of the world um, and not watching the, the tracker and seeing the, you know, the numbers of those diagnosed and dying and recovered. Um, but I do want to encourage you all um, to go back and watch the movie again if you saw it. I'm, I'm confident you will see something different 
in the movie again. There are so many metaphors in the movie that we didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, there is the bicycle and the metaphor of the bicycle. Um, there's the boxing we talked a little bit about there, but there is so much um, in the movie. I am grateful that the movie was made. I, I do want to thank, um, you know, the, those that had uh, were responsible for that, LeBron James, Octavia Spencer, the actors and actresses. And, and then to thank you all for this great discussion, I encourage you to not just watch the movie, but pick up the phone and have um, a continued discussion about what this movie means to you and to those around you. Be well, happy holidays to everyone, and I look forward to seeing you at our next discussion. Thank you.